Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today I'll be talking about earthquakes. This is from the IB Geography Geophysical Hazards Unit. I believe it's option D of paper one. Okay, so an earthquake. Here are some bullet points that I've made. So you could take a, you know, look at them. It really covers the essential facts you might need to know about an earthquake. Okay, moving on. So what is a fault line? Well, a fault line is a long crack in the surface of the earth. Earthquakes usually occur along the fault lines. So as you can see, you could see like a really clear separation here. That's a fault line. So again, to reiterate, a fault is a fracture or a zone of fractures between two blocks of rock. Faults allow the blocks to move relative to each other. This movement may occur rapidly in the form of an earthquake or may occur slowly in the form of a, of a creep, which I will cover in another video. So I think a really famous fault line that's like really big is the one in St. Andreas. Okay, moving on. So what is an earthquake, right? An earthquake is a series of vibrations that emanate from a focal point below the surface of the earth as tectonic plates experience a sudden release of pressure. Earthquake events are increasingly turning into a large scale disaster when you consider ever expanding urban areas located on or close to plate boundaries. So here's a map here that shows the earthquake intensity. You can see it in the little legend. So if you know what the Pacific Ring of Fire is, I mentioned it in my tectonic plates video and my volcano video, you can see this. It's really intense here. You can see this pattern. And I think sometimes you have to recognize that in an exam. Okay, now moving on to, you know, the essential parts of knowing the earthquake. I'm not really sure. This is like a structure. Anyways, it is really important to know the differences between all of these. So A right here is a focus, focus. And B is an epicenter, which is directly above the focus. You see the dotted lines right there. And C is what I talked about earlier, the fault line. So to talk about it a little bit, the focus is the point within the plate where the rocks start to fracture. It is the origin of the earthquake. So this is where the earthquake happens. And directly above the focus on the Earth's surface is the earthquake epicenter. So the point on the Earth's surface vertically above the focus of the earthquake. So up. And again, fault lines represent fracture lines on the surface of the Earth where tectonic movements occur. Right here. All of these pictures depict the same thing. And I hope it makes it easier for you to understand. So a summary of what I've just been talking about. You could skip this part or you could read it. An earthquake is what happens when two blocks of the earth suddenly slip past one another. Their surface where they slip is called the fault or fault plane, fault line. The location below the surf earth's surface where the earthquake starts is called a hypocenter, which can also be referred to as the focus. And the location directly above it on the surface of the earth is called the epicenter. Sometimes an earthquake has four shocks. There are smaller earthquakes that happen in the same place as the larger earthquake that follows. Scientists can't tell that an earthquake is a four shock until the larger earthquake happens. The largest main earthquake is called the main shock, which is pretty obvious. Main shocks always have aftershocks that follow. These are smaller earthquakes that occur afterwards in the same place as the main shock. So essentially, what causes earthquakes and where do they happen? So to debrief you a little bit, the Earth has four major layers, right? The inner core, outer core, mantle, and the crust. The crust and the top of the mantle make up a thin skin on the surface of our planet. So, but this skin is not all in one piece, right? It is made up of many pieces like a puzzle covering the surface of the Earth. Not only that, but these puzzle pieces keep slowly moving around and sliding past one another, another excuse me, and bumping into each other. These puzzle pieces, as I put in an analogy, are tectonic plates, are the edges of tectonic plates, right? The plate boundaries are made up of many faults, many fault lines, and most of the earthquakes around the world occur on these faults. Since the edges of the plates are rough, they get stuck while the rest of the plate keeps moving. Finally, when the plate has moved for far enough, the edges unstick on one of the faults and there is an earthquake. So you can kind of imagine like slipping, puzzles getting stuck, you know, all that jazz. It's kind of like an earthquake.
I hope that analogy helps. So, of course, with earthquakes, there are differing depths of the focus of earthquakes. So there are shallow earthquakes, intermediate earthquakes, and deep earthquakes, or deep foci, or deep focus. So first, on to the shallow earthquakes. Generally, these are the ones that are most common, uh, the ones that we experience as humans. So in general, shallow earthquakes tend to be more damaging than deeper ones, since seismic waves from deep earthquakes travel farther to the surface, losing energy along the way. Shallow earthquakes release their energy closer to the surface, resulting in more intense shaking and a higher potential for damage to structures and communities. So a shallow earthquake are, earthquakes are between 0 and 70 kilometers deep. So I'll be explaining a little bit about the energy and why shallow earthquakes are more damaging after I cover the deep one. Okay. Now, intermediate earthquakes. So of the total energy released in earthquakes, 12% comes from intermediate earthquakes. That is, quakes with a focal depth ranging from about 60 to 300 kilometers. Okay, now a deep earthquake, this one's pretty long, a deep focus earthquake is in seismology is an earthquake with a hypocenter focus depth exceeding to 300 kilometers. So remember that little like circle in the middle of the, the ground from the picture? It starts like three, more than 300 kilometers deep. So they occur most exclusively at convergent boundaries in association with subducted oceanic lithosphere. They occur along a dipping tabular zone beneath the subduction zone known as the Warati Benioff zone. You can look at this more in Britannica. I'll put it in the link down below. The strength of shaking from an earthquake diminishes with increasing distance from the earthquake's source, like from the focus. So let's say there's a shallow earthquake, right? That starts at 20 kilometers. Let's say um, the roof here is 20 kilometers. This is the surface, right? And this is 20 kilometers. And let's say the deep one is 500. So let's say it's like here at the bottom of this um, square. When it's from here, the energy releases up, right? And then from here, energy releases up, but it has to go all the way up here. That's why shallow earthquakes are more damaging. You see, it's only a little bit. So they, they just go like boom and then shake, shake, shake. But then, yeah, you get they have a long way to go. They have a long way to go. That's why they start to lose energy. And sometimes we don't even feel them. Sometimes it just gets lost around here. And so about 3% of total energy comes from deeper earthquakes. The frequency of occurrence falls off rapidly with increasing focal depth in the intermediate range. Okay, all good. So now let's talk about the types of waves, the types of earthquake waves. So the first one is P waves, initial shaking, S waves, most destructive, the love wave, and the Rayleigh wave. What's interesting about the love wave and Rayleigh wave is that they're named after people. Okay, anyways, let's move on. So the P waves, or primary waves, are the first waves to arrive at a seismograph, which is one of the ways you measure earthquakes and detect them. You know, the line things? Yeah. So P waves are the fastest seismic waves and can move through solid, liquid, or gas. They leave behind a trail of compressions and rare fractions of the medium they move through. P waves are also called pressure waves for this reason. Certain animals, such as dogs, can feel the P waves much before an earthquake hits the crust. Humans cannot. They only can feel the, like, the ramifications it has on the crust. Like, if the ground, tables, anything is shaking, we could feel that. But we can't feel, like, anything further than that. Dogs can. So cool. Anyways, here are the characteristics. It's a body wave, fastest, reaches the surface first, travels through liquid, solids, or gas. Um, causes backwards and forward shaking. As you can see from this image right here, it goes, like, it, like, presses onto each other. It's, like, coming together, yeah. And then least damaging, since it's, like, the primary wave. So, again, you might be like, hey, what's a body wave? So, body waves are the waves that can travel through the layers of the, of the Earth. They are the fastest waves, and as a result, the first waves that seismographs can record. Body waves can move through all states of matter, including rocks and molten lava. So, yeah, again, it looks something like this. So, if we look at a video, this is what it kind of looks like. So this is like the least 
destructive. Okay, now F S waves, which are super dis um, destructive, excuse me. So S waves or secondary waves are the second waves to arrive during an earthquake. They are much slower than P waves and can travel only through solids. It is after studying the tra trajectory of S waves through the layers of the Earth, scientists were able to conclude that Earth's outer core is liquid. Anyways, S waves or secondary waves are seismic waves that follow P waves and are slower than them. Unlike P waves, S waves are shear waves, meaning they move particles perpendicularly or perpendicular to the direction of the wave propagation. So as you can see here, it's like literally like a wave, right? If you get like a slinky, it's kind of like that, I guess. So yeah, you could see it's like this. And this is really, really damaging. So surface waves can only travel on the surface of the earth. Yeah. So this is a video. You can see how it's like. I think it's quite obvious from this that S waves are much more distract. Um, destructive okay now let's move on the love waves so love and Rayleigh waves are guided by the free surface of the earth they follow along after the p and s waves have passed through the body of the planet both love and Rayleigh waves involve horizontal particle motion but only the latter type has vertical ground displacements one kind of surface wave is called a love wave again named after a British mathematician, Love. Imagine having the last name Love. That is lovely. Love waves produce entirely horizontal motion. It's like up and down, I guess. The amplitude is largest at the surface and diminishes with great depth. Okay. So this is what it kind of looks like. Cool. Okay. And Rayleigh waves... The other kind of surface wave is the Rayleigh wave. A Rayleigh wave rolls along the ground with a more complex motion than love waves. So they're like, yeah, you can see the picture right there. Although Rayleigh waves appear to roll like waves on the ocean, the particle motion is opposite of ocean waves. Because it rolls, it, mo because it, rolls, it moves the ground up and down. Absolutely terrifying. And forward and backward in the direction that the wave is moving. Most of the shocking felt, shaking felt from an earthquake is due to a Rayleigh wave, which can be much larger than the other waves. So this is what it looks like if it loads. Oh my goodness, there's an ad. Excuse me. Yeah, it's like that. Okay, now let's look at this map. So the relationship between intensity of earthquake activity with the type of plate boundary associated with that movement. So as you can see, look at this like earthquake, right, depth thing. You could see that it really, really highlights the tectonic plates. Like you could see the um, Pacific plate so clearly right here. And you could also see the African plate as well. It's really interesting to look at this. And the Indo-Australian plate here as well. Very good. Okay, moving on. Human triggers of earthquakes. Oh, sorry. This is like literally the template from Canva. Okay, please ignore this. Okay, so the first example I have is dam building and earthquakes. So essentially in China, in um, Sichuan, China, they were making this Zipingu Zing, dam and an cause an earthquake so there's a link here that i'll add into the link below like description below and you could read a little bit of the info here yeah this is like a case study kind of and another example i have is a quarry so which is like kind of a mining facility i suppose so because of that it caused like a 5.4 magnitude earthquake caused by humans and yeah I've also included a link, and I'll put that below. Okay, now this one's really important, secondary um, earthquake hazards. So what happens afterward, right? Earthquake is the primary thing, right? It, it happens first. What what happens next? These guys, tsunamis, landslides, and liquef liquefaction, excuse me. So first, tsunamis. 
So this is a Google definition, a long high sea wave caused by an earthquake, submarine landslide, or other disturbances. I don't know what a la- submarine landslide is. Anyways, oh my, this is very long. By far, the most destructive tsunamis are generated from large, shallow earthquakes. I talked about how lo- shallow earthquakes are the most damaging, right? Yeah. With an epicenter or fault line near or on the ocean floor. So if your, you know, thing is in the ocean, because that's clear, if you don't have like an ocean near you and get an earthquake, I don't know, that's, that's not going to cause a tsunami, you're safe. These usually occur in regions of the earth characterized by tectonic subduction along tectonic plate boundaries. The high seismicity of such regions is caused by the collision of tectonic plates, which I've said earlier. So yeah, you can read all of this. And an example of, you know, tsunamis that would be good to note down is the great 1960 Chilean tsunami, which was gener- which generated like a magnitude of 9.5, had like a huge destructive thing. And other places that, you know, you can notably search for tsunamis can be like Hawaii and Japan and anywhere else in the Pacific, really, because of the Pacific Ring of Fire. So, Chile, Hawaii, and Japan. Very good for tsunami research. Moving on, yeah, here are some real-life examples. So, March 11th, 2011, there was the um, big Japanese um, earthquake, Great East Japan earthquake, which caused um, a huge tsunami. You can see some, these, these are real pictures. Yeah, very scary. You could search about this more online. Okay, second, landslides. So landslides basically kind of look like this picture right here. And the Google definition is the sliding down of a mass of earth or rock from a mountain or cliff. So earthquake-induced ground movements have long been considered a secondary effect of earthquakes as opposed to ground vibrations. However, many examples from around the world have shown that their destructive potential can be very high. And I suppose it is, because if a rock falls down a cliff and hits this car, the person in here is definitely dead. Earthquakes generally trigger superficial ground movements, hence landslides, right? There might be like unstable trees there and it could fall off. Another notable example, again, it's Japan, a lot of earthquakes in this country, Japan's northern island of Hokkaido, so like the head of Japan, has been hit by a powerful earthquake, triggering landslides that engulfed houses. So you can see here that this landslide right here has attacked this house, this whole entire little town of people, and the farm as well has been ruined. It's really deadly. And the last one is liquefaction. I don't have a real-life example for this, but you can try searching one online because I know it has happened in places before. So, the process, wi- process, excuse me, the process, process which causes soil to behave more like a liquid than a solid during an earthquake. So it's quite obvious from the name. So liquefaction takes place when loosely packed waterlogged sediments at or near the ground surface lose their strength in response to sh- strong ground shaking. Liquefaction occurring beneath buildings and other structures can cause major, major damage during earthquakes. So just imagine like you have a, you know, a nice building and it's like built on solid soil, right? Of course it's going to stay. But if that soil becomes like really muddy, kind of like slime, it's not going to stay. And it's going to end up like this, right? Yeah. The phenomenon can result in ground instability, causing buildings and infrastructure to sink or tilt during seismic events. Absolutely terrifying. So you could take a look at this picture right here, which I think depicts it super well. So we have stable soil, right? All packed soil cells. I don't think it's cells. Excuse me, particles. And when there's like a a lot of water in there, it destabilizes the soil by increasing the space between the grains. So, boom. Gone. Okay. I think that is it for the video. Thank you for watching. I hope you were able to learn something from this earthquake video. Thank you.